Hello, and welcome back to From the Ground Up, a University of Chicago public policy podcast. I'm Logan Morales, and I'm here with my friends Rand and Christian. And today I'm excited to introduce Dr. Derek Hudson to the podcast. Dr. Hudson is a professor in international relations in the Department of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at the Colorado School of Mines. Dr. Hudson, welcome. Thank you for having me here. Now, Dr. Hudson, you hold a unique cross-section of expertise. You come at issues of natural resources from a broad humanistic lens that spans political science and theory. Uh, interested in walking through ethical and moral implications at each, each step of the process from the mine itself, and we'll focus on Africa because that's a region you put a lot of thought into, uh, all of the way into the hands of consumers. So to kick off with, when we talk about the natural resources space, it can be easy to look at a project or practice and identify the ways in which it might pose moral or ethical concerns. That is to say, it's easy to sense when something might be going wrong. It's much harder, though, to identify when, from an ethical perspective, things are going right. So you work a lot on environmental ethics surrounding natural resources. What is the normative framework that you use to distinguish what's ethical from what isn't? So I've been pondering these questions now for about two months, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share with you and your audience my PhD is in international relations with a focus in, in African politics and teach courses in African development and ethnicity and so on. So the word that really stood out to me when I was thinking about this question was normative, which is sort of like a, sort of a philosophical approach to think about development and about ethics and the environment. What I tend to really think about whenever I'm in this space is I'm inspired by William Easterly. So I use his work, The Tyranny of Experts, in my African development course. He's a pretty well-known economist. And I have students listen to a debate between him and Owen Bart, who is also closely aligned with Jeffrey Sachs. So, quite context for this debate, you know, Jeffrey Sachs and Barter and others, they really, in the 90s, were deeply committed, and I, and I believe they were and are, continue to be, on how to deal with the, allevi the alleviation of poverty and to raise literacy rates and to foster development around the world to include Africa. And so they developed all these Millennium Development Goals, of which there were eight. We now are in the SDGs. Easterly's major critique, and this is sort of a normative lens that I use, which is why I'm raising him, is that in the world of economics, the default tends to be very technocratic, very much about cost-benefit analysis, and issues around ethics, sustainability, typically are not holistically incorporated in thinking about sustainability. And I think what Easterly is trying to point out to his, his colleagues who are economists, that this overly technocratic, utilitarian, cost-benefit way of thinking about development is not sustainable and often doesn't even begin to address the needs of the poor. So to your point, Logan, what I'm getting at here, this is really in some ways not ethical because you're not dealing with the equity issues and justice issues, which are, for many countries in Africa, this is front and center if they only could actually articulate those when they're thinking about what they want to do in terms of development. So his point is, that's why I use this word tyranny, it becomes a tyranny that African countries have to often get caught up into having to engage in the conversation around development in this way. So what I'm trying to do, Logan, in my small corner of the, of the universe is to help students try to be more holistic when they're thinking about development to include in mining. 
so that it's not seen as an afterthought. So that's one. That's still a bit too abstract, right? It's very propositional. Another one's even more concrete. So I used to spend time in the nonprofit sector locally here in Denver. And what I really came across in the community development literature in underserved and underrepresented neighborhoods in the United States is called ABCD, easy acronym. So it stands for Asset-Based Community Development. So the key word there is assets. A lot of development work in, quote-unquote, the inner city, such as, say, the south side of Chicago there, where I think all of you are located, is that groups go in, you know, a university goes in or an NGO goes in, and they're coming from the outside. They mean well, but they have all the, quote-unquote, expertise and the community that's going to be the receiver is going to articulate what they need. So even right there, that to me is problematic. It creates an immediate power differential because the outside entity has all the quote unquote know-how and expertise and the community that is underserved, et cetera, is there to receive. So it's a very passive kind of engagement. And the community puts itself into this sort of need, sort of scarcity mindset, or what I sometimes call a deficit mindset. Instead, I would try to articulate Logan normatively that how about we have a conversation about what assets are already in that community? I'm sure there are doctors there. There are teachers there. There are faith leaders there, entrepreneurs small business owners. So you identify what the existing assets already are in place and you build on those. That to me is a major normative shift on how you might quote unquote approach underserved communities to not view them and they don't view themselves from the standpoint of deficit. We don't have this, we don't have that. As opposed, we say, no, we have all these amazing things. How can we partner together to think about how we might develop this community? Hopefully, those two examples made some sense. That was very interesting. Thank you for that. And so with that as a background, our plan for this conversation is to sort of trace a mineral's path, as we've been talking about in our previous episodes of this podcast going from extracting minerals in mines, going further to processing, and then of course to the consumers. And at each juncture, we want to talk a little bit about the ethical dilemmas that different actors face there. So Rand, do you want to take it away? Yeah. So thinking about operations on the ground, uh, we've touched on environmental ethics a little bit in previous episodes, uh, especially in the context of protections for mining workers and surrounding communities. With regards to mining, if there aren't uh, a great deal of projects that take this kind of approach, what kind of constraints do you think that they're facing that makes it more difficult? Well, I think what the the challenge here is perhaps mining companies and other large sectors are part of this larger neoliberal cost-benefit paradigm that predominates in most of higher education. So you're right, Rand, this is a daunting challenge. So I think my my response to that would be is to look for companies or people or programs that can do the following. It comes a, a perhaps a, a bad word to some people, socialism. Uh, this word is rife with disinformation. And I don't think many of us, sometimes myself included, we sort of don't really know what that word means. But here are four versions of it, and then I'll try and get to your answer. The first version of socialism does not really question corporate capitalism. I want to be very clear about how I just said that. So whether you are a liberal or a conservative, Capitalism is not the issue. It's about how to perhaps make it more or less unequal, right? 
So liberals are more apt to say you have to have some sort of social intervention to rein in capitalism, to tamp down inequality. But the it's not about getting rid of capitalism. Conservatives say, no, you need to just allow the market, include the mining sector, to do what it does, and it will somehow magically, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing on purpose, I often laugh whenever I, I make this comment about the so-called invisible hand. I don't think it's so invisible. I think people create roles, and it's not invisible. The point is, that's one type of socialism. The other one I think a lot of Americans tend to think about often, or have thought about often, is the Soviet model, where it's complete state control of the market. So the, the, the state determines everything about what's going to happen in the market, to include the mining sector. China, which until as of late, I would say the last four or five years, maybe a little, maybe a decade now, was seen as a hybrid. So you have private capitalism, but a lot of state intervention. The fourth one, Rand, is the one I'm hoping that more and more students at schools of public policy or a program like NREP, et cetera, can think about. And that's to democratize the companies you work for. What do I mean by that? I think that the big challenge or the constraint ran is that corporate capitalism is not democratic. It's a board of trustees or shareholders, and they're making all the decisions for everybody else. But the co-op idea is where everybody in the company owns a part of the company. If you wanted a concrete response, that would be it. To the extent you can identify people and companies that are truly, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead, that are moving beyond just talking about diversity and inclusion, if they're doing that, that to me is a step in the right direction of what that would look like in real time and not just a bumper sticker. So I think it's companies that really make a decision and a commitment that everybody in the company owns a part of that company and they all make decisions about what's going to happen in that company. And I think my hope would be, Rand, that these other issues around sustainability and ethics would begin to become more holistically incorporated in the ethos of that company. I think now the models that we have, the big companies, this is really a challenge until that sort of shift can start to happen. So that would be my response to that question. Awesome. Great. So we're going to pivot a little bit to be a little bit more specific regarding your research on African nations. How can African nations ensure that local communities benefit from extracting and developing their natural resources and what strategies could be employed to promote inclusive growth and reduce inequality? Well, I have maybe three major responses to that. So the first one is called national content policies. So these are policies that are put into place by governments that require any company to include a mining company. If they're going to hire the certain percentage of the workforce be from the local population, right? And more than that, they have to have a commitment to employing people in all different parts of the company. So all the way from lower skilled to highly skilled workers that are part of that company moving forward. So it is, I think, rather incumbent, Christian, on governments to be very proactive about promoting these kinds of policies and, of course, enforcing them moving forward. So that would be one. Countries that have done this with some degree of success are in Nigeria and Angola. The second one is education. Well, let me, let me unpack this a bit more. 
So I've done some work with New Mine Mining Corporation, Gold Mining Co Corporation, and they they gave me and a few other colleagues some seed money to start to encourage my STEM faculty to incorporate issues of ec into existing STEM curriculum. Newmont has 15 global partners that are institutions of higher learning. So Christian, I'm still trying to get my mind around what that means to Newmont. But what I'm hoping it might mean is, New is Newmont committed to really developing education at the post-secondary and graduate level in the countries they want to do business in. Why is that important? African countries in particular, kind of like African Americans in the United States, have, have been doing a lot of catch up. What do I mean by that? After the Civil War ended, many you know, African Americans began to quickly realize with Jim Crow setting in in the American cell, they were going to have to create a completely parallel set of colleges and universities just to do basic education. And they and these became known as the, the HBCUs, and more precisely, Christian, I would say these are the agricultural and mechanical universities. So that's why you have Florida A&M and Morgan State and Tuskegee, because Booker T. Washington knew he needed to find a, an educational platform to help African Americans in the American South transition from the agrarian way of, of an economy to an industrial economy. And it wasn't going to happen in the predominantly white institutions. So Christian, why, the reason why I sort of meandered away from the question for a moment, that also I think might need to happen in African colleges and universities because many Africans feel they cannot get what they need on the mother continent and they go outside. Often they stay abroad, obviously, we all are very smart here, because they won't be able to get the job that they want if they go back home to Angola. So they stay overseas. I would like to think that if a company like Newmont is truly committed to things like this, diversity and inclusion, that should be part of their investment strategy, is to say, we're going to heavily invest in African universities to actually do research and development. Because if they do that, then they're going to get the talent that they need in those countries. And what's in it for Newmont would be that they all get folks from those countries to work at Newmont in those countries. So I do think it could be a win-win. It is actually in the best interest of Newmont to pursue that strategy. I mean, De Beers did this with regard to the Kimberly Protocols. They got out in front of the problems around blood diamonds. Although, you know, I don't think they were particularly participating in that, but they knew that if, if they could get out in front of that issue and say, we're going to actually do due diligence, that actually is good for our bottom line, that we're willing to do that kind of work. So that would be my, be my second thing. I think that might be, I think I kind of incorporated those two together. So the, the educational piece, Christian, I think is huge. That companies, are they willing to commit to a really holistic, comprehensive strategy to promote, in this case, STEM and policy education in those countries where they'll be doing business to help develop that talent base? Because I think otherwise we're going to still be in this sort of hit or miss kind of universe with regard to moving this needle forward. Great. Thanks for that. You mentioned diversity and inclusion. I kind of wanted to pick up off of that. You've led efforts on diversity, inclusion, and access, D, I, and A, throughout your career. And I wanted to ask you about that term, D, I, and A, as it applies to mining and energy. Typically, when corporations boast about their diversity and inclusion measures, they kind of just leave it at DNI. So you see a lot of corporations saying DNI this, DNI that, you know. And at the same time, many do very little to actually improve the lives of marginalized individuals at their company and in the communities that they operate in. So 
what is this dynamic like in the natural resource and energy industries? And what do you think other lenses on inclu on inclusivity like DI and A might offer here? I think I, I think I've sort of already answered that question, but I think to add a little more to the social justice piece. So Logan, to move the needle to demonstrate to people that the, the companies really are trying to think about inclusion and access, right? I mean, diversity is you bring a lot of different types of people, different types of ideas to the table. But as you know, Logan, that, that doesn't mean that there's inclusivity or access because if the power dynamics have not been challenged or unearthed, then the same kinds of ideas still are going to be the ones that get hurt, right? <laughs> so if I could just comment quickly, and, and you can laugh if you like, you know, when I'm in a faculty meeting, you know, my tenured colleagues speak more than non-tenured people, right? So it's there's a dynamic that there's a culture in that room. The same four or five people always speak. If my department or any given department really wants inclusivity, they have to think about talking about why is it that the tenured people talk and the non-tenured people don't talk. To come around to this sort of social justice idea, there are three sort of pillars why it's rendered invisible. And I think I'm trying, by my ends, I'm trying to amplify companies I think need to have a commitment to, to make these visible in the work that they do. The one is this sort of social, technical dualism. That's the first one. I think in the mining sector or in a lot of STEM education, the way people are trained, they are trained, and I actually, I have an undergraduate in engineering. So you're trained to identify a very specific problem. You define the parameters around the problem. And then you have these 10 steps to solve the problem. So it's very technical. It's very methodical. And that's fine. But there's no context around the problem. So my world, I'm trying to put context around the problem. So here's an example of what I mean by that. Sometimes I will show people um, a shorthanded hoe. You look at that artifact. And an engineer would design that. A client would tell them, we want it to have these kinds of specs. So the engineer will happily go and design that artifact. The engineer might say, it's neutral. I'm just being told what to produce. Then I show a picture of a 1960s United Farm Workers archives, uh, farm workers in California. And they are all in the field, you know, work in the fields in California in the hot sun, no trees, with shorthanded hoes. So all the men are, of course, crouched down, and of course, they are facing away from each other. In the distance is a, an overseer or the manager, and he has a long-handed hoe, so he's standing up. So I then say, talk about that photograph. Those men are using that shorthanded hoe. The man in, who is watching over them can easily identify people or the men who are not working and or if they're trying to talk to each other. That's why I make the point about them facing away from each other. So now what have I done? I've tried to put context around that artifact. I know this would be a, this would require a major shift in curriculum, so that's why Logan. That's what I'm trying to do with my STEM colleagues, is to help encourage them to 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 do this kind of work, and maybe you can do it in policy work as well. So my my pitch has always been in this regard that we really need to, in our education of STEM, in particular encourage STEM faculty, not just social scientists like me, to incorporate issues of equity and justice in existing STEM curriculum. 
Because issues around equity and justice and social justice are already there. Notice what I just said just now. It's not that it's not there. It's already there, but it's been rendered invisible by the way that engineers are taught. They are taught to render it invisible because it's simply just trying to, quote unquote, solve a problem. I had two of my colleagues do a workshop earlier last year, and I got a really good vibe from all of them. And they all felt, I think I could do this. I, I did that because I well, I don't want my STEM colleagues to feel like they have to revamp what they're already doing. No, they don't. They just have to make it visible. I, I know I keep saying that. And I think there's a lot of disinformation that that there is a sort of drive that DINA is trying to be infused or overtake. No, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just simply saying it's already in the curriculum. Just make it visible. So that's one. The second one, which is really, really challenging, Logan, I would just admit it, but it's the, it is the tyranny of meritocracy. What, what I mean by that is it is almost a theology if I may use that word loosely, that hard work and talent is proportionate to where you're going to end up in life. Of course, hard work and talent matter a tremendous amount. So I want to make sure I say on the podcast, for the record, of course, hard work and talent matters. Okay, make sure I said that. It's very clear in the podcast. But are there other things why people end up at the quote unquote, the finish line, whatever we think that is. Is it luck? Is it legacy? Is it social capital, people that you know, who you know, et cetera? So a lot of other things, why someone is where they are and why someone else is not. So all of these kinds of things are, I think, needed, Logan, to become more visible in the curriculum. So I think that needs to be an integral part of how we're going to move the needle on DINA, which is why I've had this, again, this commitment. Again, you know, you know Christian knows I'm here at mine for the long haul. And he, he's laughing because yeah, I think sometimes he wonders why I am. But you got to have faculty who are committed to staying the course to help think about how are we going to bring this kind of work into the curriculum. Because even when I go, my hope would be it will live there into perpetuity. It's not just enough just to have me here for a season. It has to live in the curriculum. And then you have to have it presented in such a way because one of my, my STEM colleagues did his module, Logan for Extra Credit, because he was very nervous about it. But he has told me he's going to actually make it a requirement. And that's what I want. So now Gus will be able to do that into perpetuity. And he won't need me to do it. He won't need me to advocate for him or to encourage him or cajole him. By the way, Logan, what he did was he did a, an, an extra credit assignment on having students think about the algorithms around search and frisk policies in New York. So he, and he put in questions in there around context. But as we all know in, the, in this room, in the Zoom call, you know, the algorithms that AI is pulling, leaning down, is just pulling down all of the hits of who is getting pulled over. So there's bias often in those algorithms. So we need computer scientists in this case to know how to be aware of those biases in the, the coding that they are designing. So that's what he did. So that's a really concrete way for him to include or make visible equity and justice, even in a course like stats, right? So, so hopefully I amplified that response on that question. Definitely did. Thank you so much. So to pivot back, a little bit going back to African countries. How do the African countries balance their economic growth and development needs while also protecting the ownership of their natural resources and their environment? And 
are there examples of successful strategies or policies that have been implemented in this regard? Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on examples of natural resource management projects that have been balanced by development and environmental protections. Well, the one that comes to mind again uh, is that Kimberly protocols. So in this case, it was Belgium, United States, and who's the third country? I think the UK. And the, the countries in Africa were Botswana, South Africa, and the third one escapes me. But they came together and they put together a series of protocols that would, you know, ensure A, that diamond production would be ethical and sustainable, particularly for the artisanal miners in those countries. So, so Christian, I'm sure you're well aware, there are two types. There are the illicit and illicit miners. The concern was that the illicit miners are doing it for a variety of reasons. They don't want to deal with the licensing. It's, it's a way for them to make money, but they are, of course, very prone to being exploited. So these protocols are put into place to ensure that they, the workers, are not exploited and the environment is also not exploited. So those protocols have had some degree of success over time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Alrighty then. So to leave off with Dr. Hudson, we always like to do takeaways. So just this one last piece, we're wondering if you have anything that you'd like to leave us off with, a bit of advice for students who are working in public policy or if not public policy, they want to have an impact on the natural resources sector. Maybe they want to take away some of the normative framework you've laid out for us today for those of us who are listening to this podcast. So maybe a key takeaways would be, I, I didn't actually mention this, but one takeaway I would mention is maybe more at a micro level. You know, when we, when we were talking about, you know, inclusion and diversity and moving beyond words, is what I call the four levels of solidarity. So this is one takeaway. So the four levels are you move from symbolic to transactional to transactional to transformational. And so what I mean by that is, you know, at the lowest level, you have statements of inclusion, of solidarity, the symbolic. The next one is transactional, where different groups come together and make a commitment. I'll go to your event, you come to my event, right? So kind of build solidarity across different groups. The last two are the most challenging. And that's when you really begin to see if you were to gain with the other group lose and you might decide to not pursue your own gains because they would be, they would lose, the other group would lose. So that begins to transform all the groups to truly be in solidarity. So you go from a sort of symbolic, you know, gesture a statement, which is important to the starting point, transactional, where you maybe attend each other's events to get educated about what the issues are, to transformational, where you now know that if I gain, I want to make sure the other groups also gain. So that's the highest level of solidarity. So that might be one takeaway. I think the other one is the one that I started with. I think that just this whole idea of thinking about the planner and the seeker in development and in policy. Just that simple idea of thinking about when we're thinking about an issue or a problem, are we viewing it as a closed, closed technical problem or an open-ended problem that has infinite ways to contextualize it? So just something as simple as that. And I think my third one, I didn't think it would be, but it is this educational piece. I, I do think that that is a major important takeaway to encourage students to, to, to hire faculty that can do this equity and justice work in existing curriculum. I think those would be my three big takeaways. Amazing. Well, 
Thank you, Dr. Hudson, so much for speaking with us today. I know I learned a lot. I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in today. If any of our audience wants to ask questions, chat, or engage with the podcast in any way, don't hesitate to drop us a line at uc3p from the ground up at gmail.com. Thanks all for listening. See you next time.